Yeah, super, super excited to be here. <laughs> uh, I've been wanting to come to Parallel Nepolis, to HCPP for, for years, so uh, excited to get to come this year and not only come, but actually get to, to speak to you all and, and talk about two topics that I'm deeply passionate about um, in Monero and crypto anarchy. And, and funnily enough, the whole concept of crypto anarchy is actually relatively new to me um, and was introduced by Uri and Pavel who I had on my podcast last year. Um, and so it's very much a newer topic for me, so I don't, don't view me as a, an OG in the, the crypto anarchy or cypherpunk space. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of new in all of this, but have become deeply passionate about the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, so today, obviously, we'll look at Monero there. Um, a very brief outline, we're going to look through how financial privacy is the root of other human rights uh, and how unless we have that financial privacy and tools that, that give us autonomy when transacting, uh, the rest of our rights actually fall aside quickly. Um, we'll touch on the war on financial privacy as we've been seeing it just recently unfold, uh, the kind of the current trends we've seen, um, and then walk through a brief history of Monero, how Monero creates both uncensorable transactions and unstoppable mining. Um, I know those words are a little bit um, intentionally aggressive, but we'll touch on how those actually work. Uh, and then ultimately how Monero can fit into your toolkit. Because uh, this isn't a talk that I want to be philosophical as much as helping you to understand what Monero is, how it works, and how it can be a valuable piece of you opting into crypto anarchy and opting out of broken systems. Um, so very quick intro, obviously Mar already gave some of this. Uh, this isn't actually announced yet, so you're all the only people that know this, but I, I'm now the head of content at Foundation Devices, um, who make uh, sovereignty tools, right now a Bitcoin hardware wallet. Um, I'm a privacy educator, pri pro-privacy content education guides. Uh, I run a podcast on the topics as well. Um, and I'm also a Monero contributor, mostly in non-developer roles. Um, so mostly, again, in kind of guides, helping onboard people, helping to simplify the process of people actually using these tools in real life. Uh, a lot of today will focus on excerpts from a cypherpunks manifesto um, and i would assume many of you have have probably read this if you haven't go ahead and read it even now while i'm talking uh, I, I think it's a it's really a cornerstone of what most of the people speaking here believe and and what um, parallel only polo stands for there's a lot to to garner out of the cypherpunks manifesto um, and eric hughes in that he hits on this concept that the ability to have privacy in an open society requires anonymous transaction systems. Um, so it's not this kind of nice to have, like when we have financial privacy, it's a good thing, but the only way to actually have privacy in an open society is to have those anonymous transaction systems. Um, one more quick thing. So as we're thinking about this, it's important to understand that this this idea of anonymous transaction systems is one that we've had in cash for a long time, um, but obviously that's quickly being phased away. We're seeing CBDCs become central bank digital currencies, become more commonplace, and I think the pace of those is, is rapidly accelerating. Um, so we've had some tools to be able to, to opt into anonymous transaction systems. Um, and then obviously the advent of Bitcoin brought some of that as well, um, but I do think that Monero is uniquely suited for this role. So when we look at the landscape right now of financial privacy, uh, we see that there is a, a current and ongoing war against tools for financial privacy. Um, a lot of this manifests itself in financial censorship, and we'll take a look at a few of these examples up here briefly. Um, but we're seeing that countries are understanding, governments are understanding that the easiest way to crack down on broad human rights and to make people fall in line and become compliant is to leverage financial, financial censorship. Um, and to do that, they need to either leverage the tools they have at their, expose, their uh, disposal, or they need to be able to shut down the tools that we have at our disposal to opt out of their systems. Um, so in this first example, we saw this thing called the Freedom Convoy in Canada. Uh, I don't know how, how familiar you are with what went down there. Um, and politics aside on what they were actually protesting, they were doing a a nonviolent protest and attempted to raise money to be able to, to feed themselves, to put gas in their trucks, those kinds of things while they were protesting. Um, and they rapidly learned that the, the centralized fundraising tools that we, we commonly know, the GoFundMes and things like that, uh, are more than willing to comply with nation states that are actually not where they reside and not where the corporation resides. So like, for instance, GoFundMe, money was raised there and confiscated. Uh, a couple of other tools were used as well that claimed to be censorship resistant and 
claim to work, but ultimately the funds were either confiscated or just returned to donors. And as far as I know, not a single cent of those funds actually made it into the truckers' hands. Um, we did get, I think, one of the the first strong examples of what Bitcoin can be good at and bad at in this kind of example. Uh, we saw in the Freedom Convoy that people in the Bitcoin community raised funds in Bitcoin. Uh, unfortunately, they did it in an, an absolutely terrible way. The OPSEC used the approaches they used to try to actually handle the Bitcoin and distribute it um, were done too transparently. And essentially what they did was expose all the details of the transactions and the truckers themselves in this process. Um, so the, the good part is that Bitcoin did enable both the, the raising of funds in a way that was not censor censorable, um, and it actually got all of those funds into the truckers' hands. So that was a huge step forward from tools like GoFundMe, PayPal, et cetera, where there was a, no ability to even get the funds into their hands. The problem is, when the truckers actually had the funds, there was not a circular economy for them to be able to actually spend the Bitcoin and get gas, food, et cetera, directly. Um, they could have used gift cards or things like that, but as far as I know, that, that wasn't used. Um, and when the truckers tried to cash out that money on centralized exchanges, the funds that had been donated were blacklisted and surveilled. Uh, and so when they tried to actually put the funds on an exchange and cash out Canadian dollars, the funds were confiscated, and it was immediately clear who the actual truckers were who had gotten funds from this. The second example, and this is, I mean, one of a million examples of financial censorship in China. They're kind of the, uh, if you want a glimpse into the future of Western societies, I think China is a very, a very good place to look in, in kind of the dystopic turns that could be taken. Um, but we've seen very recently in China that there was actually a, a case where people's funds have been frozen in banks. They weren't able to withdraw their own funds, which obviously in, it, in and of itself is financial censorship. But when they actually attempted to congregate and stage a protest at the banks where this was actually happening, they were prevented from doing so because the government was able to leverage what is supposedly a COVID-19 measure where they can use a, an app to get a green check mark or a red X and, and say whether or not you can purchase things or travel. They use this to actually prevent them from being able to buy train tickets to ride public transit. And so the protesters actually could not physically organize to protest because they weren't able to buy the, the means of transportation they needed. Um, so again, definitely not an exhaustive list, but just an example of that recently. Um, and then the most recent one that, uh, that Jared was actually just talking about on stage here is the, the censorship of Tornado Cash and the, the US sanctions that were brought against it. Um, if you're not familiar with this tool, it's, a, it's an Ethereum smart contract that allows you to essentially deposit funds and then withdraw funds at a later time using a, an anonymous note that it gives you um, to a different, hopefully different Ethereum account um, and therefore gain privacy within Ethereum. Um, it is a decentralized smart contract. You can actually still use it today, even though it's sanctioned. I'm not encouraging you to do that, but you can and it still exists. Um, but we saw that the government noticed they couldn't actually shut down the smart contract on Ethereum. Um, and I think that is an important win for Ethereum and, and an important sign that there is some decentralization there. Uh, but because of the government knew that they couldn't easily shut down that smart contract, they went after the other things that they could shut down. Um, and those are basically just creating the, uh, the fear in the minds of citizens to prevent them from trying to use the tool. I mean, that's a, a big part of what sanctions law does is it prevents people from actually trying to, to get into something or to use a tool. Um, but they also went above and beyond, and GitHub actually removed all of the code for Tornado Cash. It's actually been restored uh, in archive mode, which is interesting. Um, and they removed all of the accounts of the main contributors to Tornado Cash. So even though they couldn't shut down the decentralized tool itself, they shut down the code, they removed it, even though thankfully there were other copies. Um, they prevented contributors from further contributing. And as mentioned in Jared's talk, they actually arrested one of the developers without charges, and he's still being held today. Um, all of this was to prevent people from gaining access to financial privacy. Obviously, the claims made by the US government is that North Korea uses it to, to wash hacked funds, um, but even in their own documentation, the highest estimate they give for the percentage of funds in Tornado Cash that are illicit is 10%. Uh, so they are knowingly and publicly stating that they're willing to shut down privacy tools even if 90% of the usage is uh, above board and compliant and normal. Um, like I mentioned, not an exhaustive list. There are more and more cases happening daily. It's hard to keep up with the news cycles in the, the privacy space and financial privacy. 
but I think these are some good examples of how if we don't have the tools or if the tools are not built with an adversarial environment in mind, uh, we quickly struggle and we lose access to other human rights as part of that. So what tools do we have at our disposal that are powerful against financial censorship? Um, obviously, cash is one of them that thankfully we can still use in most countries, not everywhere, and cash is quickly being phased out. Um, but where possible, cash provides a very private and censorship resistant payment method. Um, and that is a, a very important use case. I still recommend using cash as often as possible. I think it is a, a very powerful tool, um, but obviously it's being phased, phased out by governments and using it to transact over distance is a pain. Um, you can do cash by mail and stuff like that, but it's certainly not an enjoyable uh, experience waiting with that $500 in, the, in an envelope or something. Um, obviously then Bitcoin came along and it provides very strong self-sovereignty, strong censorship resistance right now. Um, and it is a powerful tool, but there are some important drawbacks that even uh, URI mentioned in his talk earlier due to fungibility and the ability for Bitcoin transactions to be censored, not on chain yet, thankfully. Um, I think that, that will be coming, but off chain as you try to go to an exchange or something like that, because Bitcoin is traceable and a history is attached to funds, you actually can have censorship within Bitcoin. Um, and then lastly with Bitcoin, you can use it privately uh, and it is very effective when you do so. Uh, there are great tools like Samurai Wallet out there that allow you to, to do this, but it is time consuming and can be expensive depending on network fees and other things. Um, so enter Monero, finally the, the reason for the talk. Um, <laughs> so Monero solves that core fungibility issue, that core privacy issue and censorship issue with Bitcoin and provides, a, I think, a very um, symbiotic relationship with Bitcoin as tools to, to really build out our own crypto anarchy uh, and build out our own kind of self-sovereign cyber states. Um, and then uh, a key aspect of Monero, and that's something we'll touch on as we go through, is that Monero has been built from the ground up for adversarial environments. And I think that's an important distinction that many other cryptocurrencies don't actually have. Um, I think Bitcoin is one of those that, especially in the early days, the design was centered around how is this thing going to work when nation states want to shut us down, when private companies want to shut us down. Um, but many cryptocurrencies since then have kind of taken the optimistic approach of like, this is the state of the world now, so we'll build for the state of the world now, instead of focusing on adversarial environments. Uh, and that's something where Monero has done that from the beginning, even though it was kind of not the norm, not um, what people expected or wanted. But as we've seen more and more cases of crackdown on financial privacy, more censorship. Uh, I think people are starting to understand why Monero has taken the approaches it's taken. Um, so ultimately to summarize why I think Monero is a powerful tool, it's when you go to make that payment that you know they don't want you to make. And that could be funding political dissidents, that could just be funding a political party that you worry might be deemed illegal or um, illicit in the future. Uh, that could be buying weed, that could be doing anything. Uh, when you want to make that transaction that they don't want you to make, I think that Monero has been built for this. A very quick history of Monero. I won't go through all of these, but um, uh, like I mentioned before, Monero has been building for this adversarial environment that we're entering now um, since the beginning. So it actually spawned out of the CryptoNote protocol in 2014. Uh, and this is unique in that it's not a Bitcoin fork, it's not a code fork or a chain fork. Um, but it's actually built out of a completely different protocol, uh, which was very unique in 2014, at least. Um, and then Monero has, throughout the years, constantly iterated and upgraded its network over time, um, continuing along this core ethos of building private, secure transactions for people. Each of these upgrades, these are network hard forks, but as part of that, there's under, they undergo rigorous testing, third-party audits, all of that fun stuff. So we won't get into the idea of, of hard forks today, but um, know that these upgrades have happened over the history of Monero, and we'll focus on a couple of them. So when we circle back to a Cypherpunk's manifesto, um, I love how Eric puts this concept of reducing the amount of information available. He talks about how information wants to be free and will be free, and that corporations and nation states want to make our information free, and they actually benefit by doing so. Um, and so when we're building a system for financial privacy, we have to build it in such a way that we limit the information exposed by a transaction to just what the two parties need. So not even exposing extra information to the two parties in the transaction, um, and most certainly not exposing that information to anyone who wants to look at the chain or look at the, the history of that transaction. 
So when we look at Monero and its approach to transactional privacy, um, we're not going to touch on everything that Monero does. There are approaches to network privacy, transactional privacy, um, lots of different things that are done with the Monero. But we'll focus on transactional privacy and then uh, unstoppable mining here as well. So within Monero, it takes this holistic approach using three things, uh, one-time addresses, confidential amounts, and ring signatures. And it uses these three things to essentially build transactional privacy in a way where you don't have to think about it. You don't need to worry about the past history of funds. You don't need to worry about uh, how you're constructing the transaction. Um, but the protocol actually enforces best practices and leverages these three things to build a transaction for you that is as private as possible. Um, Obviously, I'm not speaking to all threat models. Threat modeling is a whole different thing. And there are potentially ways that, that Monero funds can be not traced, but they can make uh, interesting guesses. Um, so if you have a very advanced threat model, there are some extra steps that you can take. But for most people and for the general concept of crypto anarchy, Monero covers these bases well. Um, so the first of these kind of three pillars of Monero's transaction privacy is something called one-time addresses or stealth addresses. Uh, if you've been in the Bitcoin space long, you've probably heard the term stealth addresses. It was proposed way back, uh, I think, in 2011 by Peter Todd. Um, and there have been other iterations throughout the years of this concept of stealth addresses. But essentially what this does is every time you make a transaction in Monero, someone gives you their address, just like in Bitcoin and any other cryptocurrency. When they give you this address, it's a lot longer than a normal cryptocurrency address uh, because it is this type of stealth address. So when you actually create the transaction and send funds, the only thing that's, that gets published on chain is this one-time address that's not linkable to anything else. Uh, this cannot be linked to the, the public key to the, the address that they gave you off-chain. Um, it can't be linked to any other transactions. So this means that common heuristics like wallet clustering, um, the kind of tagged addresses that you see in Bitcoin, the rich list, all of these kinds of things aren't possible because there are no two similar addresses and no ways to link addresses on chain. The other big piece of this is called confidential amounts. Uh, and this essentially means that there are no amounts present on chain in Monero. Uh, so if you make a transaction, the amount of that transaction is only known to you and the person you're sending funds to. Um, there's actually no ability to see transactions at all. Uh, the actual way this is implemented is through something um, called a, a commitment and a range proof and essentially allows you to cryptographically commit to the transaction being legitimate, to the inputs and outputs balancing, but you can do so in a way that doesn't reveal the amount to anyone, not the miners, not the mempool, uh, not anyone outside of that transaction, um, but doing it in a way that ensures that you're also not creating funds out of thin air or, or cheating the system. And then the third piece, and, and ultimately ring signatures are enabled by confidential amounts and one-time addresses to be extremely powerful, but ring signatures mean that every time that you build a transaction, every input in that transaction essentially hides among 15 decoys. Um, because in Monero, you actually never know when an output is spent. Uh, if you are familiar with the, the technical details of Bitcoin, you may have heard the, the concept of a UTXO or unspent transaction output. There actually is no, thing, no such thing as an unspent transaction output in Monero because no one except the parties in a transaction know when an output has been spent. Um, so when you create a transaction, and again, all this is done automatically for you in the background. All of this has to be done the proper way or your transaction can't be sent. Um, but when you do this, every input gets these 15 decoy inputs, which means that you have plausible deniability as the sender and no one outside of that transaction, outside of you and the other participant, even know which input is being spent in that transaction. Um, so all three come together to give very strong privacy in a way where you don't even need to understand what ring signatures are, what confidential amounts are, what stealth addresses or one-time addresses are, but you gain this privacy uh, regardless. Now, switching gears a bit from transactional privacy to mining, uh, and the reason for focusing on both transactional privacy and mining are that the concept of censorship resistance is really only enforceable if you both have financial privacy and you have decentralized mining. Because um, if you have a centralized entity who controls mining, they could mine empty blocks or they could only mine compliant transactions. There are lots of ways that they could censor the chain. And if the miners actually have visibility into transaction details, like in Bitcoin, for example, they can choose what transactions they want to include in blocks based on history, based on inputs, based on a, a blacklist or a whitelist. They have the ability to censor transactions individually because they can actually see what transactions are, their history, et cetera. 
Um, so looking at mining within Monero, some very different approaches have been taken to Bitcoin. Uh, and if we circle back to the Bitcoin white paper, um, obviously by Satoshi Nakamoto, um, we see that he focuses on this idea of proof of work solving the problem of determining representation. Um, and proof of work was really, I mean, is really one of the biggest breakthroughs with Bitcoin because it allows us to decentralize that consensus mechanism uh, and do it in a way that is very secure and that can be censorship resistant. Um, and interestingly, he actually calls out proof of work as being essentially one CPU, one vote, um, which it's not anymore. If, you, if you're aware of Bitcoin mining at all, it is mined by ASICs, which are machines designed specifically to mine Bitcoin and only Bitcoin. So when we look at Monero, a very different approach has been taken here. Um, and again, I think this is because the, the roots of Monero are very cypherpunk in nature, and that, that ethos has continued um, even until today. But as we're coming into this place where we have a war on the concept of proof of work, um, we're quickly seeing that we need ways to ensure that consensus mechanisms and mining is able to be done even in adversarial environment, environments. Um, it is very interesting. Ethereum has moved to proof of stake. Um, so far, it's not a complete failure like, like many people would like to claim proof of stake is. I'm very curious to see how that experiment plays out. Um, but they are actually already facing a crisis of censorship within Ethereum due to the fact that proof of stake, the stakers are known, and the transactions within Ethereum are transparent. So they already have issues where there's a large amount of censorship of Tornado Cash transactions by proof of stake participants. Um, but as we see this shift uh, in, a, in a war against proof of work, which I think is the more proven, more reliable consensus mechanism, uh, we need the ability to continue mining and to continue securing these tools because ultimately that's the way we can gain financial privacy and, and sovereignty, uh, even despite a nation's wishes or despite um, a, a world order's wishes. Uh, so when we look at Monero, there are two unique approaches taken here. The first one is that Monero is actually mined buy commodity hardware. If you have a smartphone, you have a laptop, you have a desktop, you can mine Monero today. Um, and it really is as simple as just firing up the Monero desktop wallet and clicking start mining. And that is a, a very, very big difference because it means that we aren't reliant on specific hardware manufacturers. We aren't reliant on you being able to import a device that's explicitly built to mine Monero. Anyone who has any of this hardware can just start mining Monero. Uh, and that makes enforcement of a a law against mining Monero extremely difficult because you're not going to take away everyone's laptops, everyone's hard, uh, desktops, everyone's smartphones. I think we're well past that phase of kind of the, the ability of an authoritarian to enforce that. And so it, it imposes this risk to central governments where they can't easily censor the hardware used to mine Monero. Um, that does leave the main kind of alternative to censorship within mining, which is through centralized mining pools. Um, within Bitcoin, within most cryptocurrencies that are proof of work mined, there are centralized pools that people essentially just point their miners to. The pool builds the block template that actually says which transactions are included in a block. And essentially the pool wields the combined power of all the miners who are, who are mining to it um, without oversight. They can do whatever they want. They can mine empty blocks. They can censor transactions. Uh, they can prefer their own transactions. Uh, they basically have carte blanche when actually handling that hash rate. Um, but this concept of a decentralized pool actually was introduced also for Bitcoin, uh, this idea of P2 pool, um, which is a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized pool uh, approach, was built for Bitcoin many years ago. As far as I can tell doing research, there's very, very little adoption of it within the Bitcoin space, um, and there hasn't been much iteration or improvement. But someone within the Monero community um, on his vacation, interestingly enough, just decided that he was going to rewrite the concept of P2 pool from the ground up, new code, new concepts, taking the basics of it, but um, really bring it into 2022 and, and bring a new approach to it. Um, and essentially what P2Pool means is that as a miner, the biggest issue with you as a, a small scale miner especially is you want to actually get paid out relatively frequently. If you're spending electricity to mine a cryptocurrency, you don't want to have to wait a year or two years to get a payout and just hope that one comes through. Um, so the concept of solo mining, of just mining directly to the chain and mining your own blocks has basically died. No one does that anymore because it's like, it's like playing the lottery. Um, but the ability to do so through a pool actually reduces that variance. So when you mine with a pool, you're sharing hash rate with everyone else and you get paid out according to the work that you do. With P2 pool, we enable that same thing where you're able to mine and get paid out at regular intervals like you'd expect. 
um, but able to do so in a way where you are actually in control of your hash rate. You decide what transactions get included in a block, and you ultimately have the say over how that pool wields the hash rate, uh, which is a big shift and ensures that if P2Pool continues gaining adoption, governments won't be able to just put pressure on known centralized pools to mine empty blocks, censor transactions, et cetera, um, but actually would have to go after individual miners, which is extremely difficult because they mine on commodity hardware. Um, so these things go hand in hand, but ultimately this enables the censorship resistance of mining within Monero, um, and it's a very different approach to Bitcoin. So some practical ways that Monero shines. Um, really, uh, this is obviously not an exhaustive list. There's very few things on here, but anything you can do with Bitcoin, you can do with Monero. Similar concept, if you know how to use Bitcoin, you know how to use Monero. Um, so any of the kind of the common uses it fits well as well, although you actually get strong financial privacy without any extra hoops. Um, but one thing that is very unique to Monero, and we talked about this idea of, of one-time addresses or stealth addresses, but what this enables is you can actually accept funds, accept donations, uh, put out a sticker with the QR code of your address, and you can do so in a way that doesn't reveal to every person in the world who sees that QR code how much funds you have, who's donated, where you spent the funds, what exchange you use, et cetera. So you can post these public addresses and do so in a way that preserves privacy for you and for your individual donors. Um, and this really just greatly simplifies all of the things that I think we gain a lot of value from within a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Monero. And that if you want to accept donations, like uh, on my blog, I, I accept donations, you just I have a QR code with my Monero address. No one has visibility into who's donated, what I do with the funds, but they're able to donate in a way that's very simple. Every Monero wallet supports a Monero address, obviously. Um, so it really simplifies the idea of donations in general. You don't need to run a BTC pay server or something like that. Even though I love BTC pay server, as much as we can, simplifying these things down means that more and more people, not just the techno, techno elite, but the people who uh, maybe are on the front lines, maybe women in Iran, they could create a QR code and post it. Um, it. It simplifies it and puts it in the hands of more and more people in a way that is still privacy preserving. Um, obviously, the rest are, are pretty self-explanatory. I think a unique thing with merchant adoption is, and, and Uri was talking about this earlier in his talk, um, but if you have a cryptocurrency that's not fungible, essentially, that has a history and, it, and isn't private by default, you can have issues where merchants wanting to adopt a cryptocurrency uh, may be hesitant to because either they want to be sure that the funds that they receive they can spend or, or translate to dollars easily, um, or maybe they don't want their uh, competitors seeing their suppliers, seeing info about customers. Maybe they don't want customers seeing what suppliers they pay, their profit margins, those kinds of things. So you do gain a lot of benefits there, even in the kind of the above board merchant adoption sense. Um, so last but not least, just some very simple ways that you can choose to plug Monero into your toolkit or not. Um, and this is very much not a talk that says that everyone has to use Monero today. I love Bitcoin, I use Bitcoin, um, and I think it's an immensely powerful tool, but I think that we need to be very uh, very open to using the tools that are the best fit for us and the job that we need. Um, so as we're pursuing these concepts like crypto anarchy, having a tool that simplifies the financial privacy aspect I think can be immensely important. Um, so obviously, one approach you could take is to walk away from this talk, sell all your fiat, sell all your Bitcoin, and only use Monero from now on. Um, that's a great way to approach it. It's certainly a drastic one, and I don't think many people are going to start using Monero for everything today. Um, it, I think, will be a, a good potential one in the future, and some people do do this today. There are people in the Monero community that are Monero only, that live off of it, that earn it, um, but obviously that is a, a very drastic approach. I think the one where most people will land is this concept of saving in Bitcoin and spending in Monero, um, and this is something I've been talking about a lot recently, but I think there, there's obviously a proven value proposition in storing value in Bitcoin. Um, there's obviously a proven adoption with Bitcoin where you can spend it at more places, you can spend Monero and other cryptocurrencies. Uh, so there is a lot of value in Bitcoin. Um, it obviously is, has name recognition, has all of these things. So the idea of storing value in, in Bitcoin, using it like your savings account, uh, and then spending in Monero, so using it like a checking account, I think fits the best for most people. Um, and this could look as simple as every paycheck or once a month, you just swap some Bitcoin for Monero on BISC, on local Monero, whatever site you want to use, hopefully a decentralized one that's non-KYC. Um, but 
you go and do that and then you spend out of Monero instead of spending Bitcoin. Uh, and I think this really gives you the best of both worlds in both actually spending cryptocurrency and storing value. Um, a quick note on that, so a, a uniquely powerful way to actually swap funds is something called atomic swaps, which we won't get into, but the Monero community has funded and driven a couple different approaches to atomic swaps with Bitcoin, which essentially means that you can swap Bitcoin for Monero and vice versa in a way that's trustless and decentralized. Uh, you don't need a central exchange, you don't need even a decentralized exchange, you can just swap peer to peer directly. Um, the last two we won't go into too much. Obviously, you could use Bitcoin for everything. I think that's probably maybe where, where more people here are at um, right now, and I think is, is going to become more the norm. I think most people will really go right to left in this, um, but uh, that's obviously an option here, and then use fiat for everything. Obviously, there are issues there. You're opening yourself up to centralized control, surveillance, etc., cetera, um, and that, I think, will only become a worse option as we have central bank digital currencies introduced. Um, very simple conclusion, just Monero was made to be a powerful tool for freedom. Uh, and I just hope that each of you can come away with a better understanding of Monero, um, but also a better understanding of why you might want to learn more about it, start to use it, and, and integrate it into your toolkit. But that's it. Uh, contact info for me, blog, Monero, info, and then uh, we can do some Q&A. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, let's do some Q&A, folks. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, Thank you for the talk. And I have a question. What do you think about Monero scalability? Because if you compare it to uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin has layer one and layer two. And if you use uh, layer one for big uh, transactions, like for house or car, uh, you won't uh, fill up the blockchain and the small uh, dust-like uh, transactions, like for coffee, will be on uh, the layer two on uh, Lightning. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the monitor? Because you can't do it there. Everything will be in the blockchain, even the big one, the big transaction, and the small one as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Actually, uh, at the Monero Conferenco, which is kind of our Monero conference earlier this year, I gave a presentation on exactly that. I don't think it's live yet, or I would give you a link, but um, there's kind of two things. First, I think that the scale that we're at, even with Bitcoin as a transaction means and not just to store a value, we still have plenty of room on layer one. I only use layer one, usually. I occasionally use Lightning, like I have been here, but... Um, so I think we kind of overestimated the need for one of those things right now, for a layer two network right now. Um, and Monero, I think, is very similar. We have less transactions than Bitcoin, usually about 10 to 15% of the daily transactions of Bitcoin. So it's less of an urgency for us, but obviously as Monero gains usage, that will become an important thing. And, and I think the key is to be able to ensure that people can continue to use Monero in a fully self-sovereign way, running their own node, et cetera. Um, so with Monero, there actually are ways to do layer two networks like Lightning. Um, there have been four or five different papers and proposals on how that could be done. Um, and that's, that's certainly something that I think that we will see and implement in the future. But it's not a need right now. Um, and the complexities of layer two networks there's just a lot of problems. I mean, even with Lightning, there are a lot of problems. There's a lot of privacy problems, some inherited from the base layer, some because of the way that gossip works. There's there's a lot of complexity in layer twos, and I don't think we're quite to the point where we either need one or really can properly implement one yet that encompasses all the things that I think we really need out of a layer two. Um, but Monero can do something like that in the future, and I certainly see that as, as something that, that will happen. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the atomic swaps. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if you could elaborate more on that, especially if it's something that's already available now. Where is the liquidity coming from? And I wonder how the exchange rate is actually determined by, by the atomic swap. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So the, the concept itself, um, to kind of sum it up, is that you use the scripting capabilities of one or both currencies, in this case, Bitcoins, because Monero actually doesn't have a scripting capability, and you use it in a way that you can build transactions where the trade will only happen if either both parties get the funds that they want or neither parties get the funds that they want and they keep their own original funds. 
So essentially it means that I could, I have no idea who you are, I don't trust you, but I could go ahead and swap Monero for Bitcoin with you and know that there's no way that you could actually steal the Monero from me or that I could steal the Bitcoin from you. Um, and it does this using the same method that all of the other tools built on top of Bitcoin um, use, which is that scripting capability. So the, the actual functionality is fairly straightforward in that concept, but the actual implementation is very tricky because Monero doesn't have a scripting capability. Um, there is one implementation of atomic swaps right now. Uh, it's created by a team called the, the commit team, C-O-M-I-T. Um, but it's incomplete and is kind of paused. But there's a, a better implementation that's in the works that was, again, funded by the Monero community called Farcaster. Um, and I can chat with you more and give you links if you want. That's That should be released soon. Uh, the main problem with atomic swaps is liquidity. So it's it's a peer-to-peer -peer swap. And with any kind of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized tool, that means there has to be someone else who wants to swap with you. You can't swap into a, a pool of liquidity or something like that. Um, so I think there will always be some liquidity issues with atomic swaps. But I think that's also where other tools like uh, there's a decentralized exchange that's very similar to Thorchain that's being built specifically for Monero. It's called Sarai, um, and it will essentially allow you to swap into a liquidity pool, which is a whole other topic, but essentially means you don't have to worry about liquidity as much as atomic swaps, but you can still do it in a decentralized way that limits your loss of custody, that, that limits all of the problems that come with even traditional decentralized exchanges. Um, just a quick one. Mm -hmm. uh, as Lightning Network basically extremely enhances anonymity and privacy uh, of its users, um, uh, where do you see use case of Monero if, if Lightning gets adopted a lot? And also, um, as the volume on, on Monero is much much lower, uh, it enables basically some guesswork on, on some transactions, and it, it might not be completely anonymous, the, the, the bridges of hmm. Monero because of lower volume compared to Lightning where the vo volume will be arguably much, much higher later on. Yeah, so two things to address there. Um, the first is that Lightning is not anonymous in many situations and is not nearly as private as originally pitched. Um, so I would definitely hazard people against assuming that Lightning is private just because they've heard that. Uh, it does have some good privacy guarantees in specific situations if you're using a non-custodial wallet, if you're hosting your own node. If you're doing all of these things, there can be reasonable privacy when sending. When receiving funds right now in Lightning, it's actually abysmal privacy, um, and sometimes even worse than layer one privacy. So there are very important flaws within Lightning that have not been fixed. There are, there are proposals to do so that have other trade-offs, um, and I hope that they're implemented. There's things like route blinding, um, and there are changes to the, the gossip mechanism in Lightning, which will let you publish less details. But the Lightning Network is not as privacy preserving as people have been led to believe. And thankfully, there are strong advocates within the community of Lightning developers that are really pushing for changes and that are building proposed solutions to those things. Um, but li the Lightning of today, I would be very hesitant to use it for a, a use case that I deemed dangerous. Um, as for the other concerns with liquidity and Monero, uh, that's kind of a bigger topic to get into. I, I don't think they're normally a problem, and decentralized swap tools like Atomic Swaps, like Sarai, uh, like BISC, et cetera, alleviate the majority of those because there's no KYC, there's no identity, and you're swapping with a, an unknown entity over the Tor network and other things. Um, so I think that that's less of a concern for actual privacy, and once you're in Monero, you have strong transactional privacy as well. Thanks for an interesting talk. <clears throat> so I've been aware of Monero since it started. Uh, I used to hold some of it and um, actually haven't looked at it in a couple of years. But what I observed at that time was that where marketplaces existed, um, the availability of goods and services was fairly thin. Um, and there were significant uh, barriers uh, both to entry and to exit, uh, fiat to Monero uh, gateways or even uh, Bitcoin to Monero gateways. There seems to be some kind of vicious cycle involved in, uh, you know, creating these barriers, KYC, AML, et cetera. How do you see the developments in Monero working to break that cycle? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's one of the 
kind of negatives of building a tool that is very adversarial in nature towards governments. I mean, Monero is not built to be a tool that's compliant. It's not built to be a tool that um, that kind of bends the knee. And when you build something that is very against what governments want, there are, there's going to be pushback. And I think Monero has kind of been at the forefront of that pushback because of the privacy that it, it offers to people. So we've seen that through the kind of shadowy back channel bans on Monero listings through exchanges, uh, where they've been forced to delist Monero, even though there's no law, there's no regulation, there's nothing that states that entities can't list Monero and, and sell it to users or buy it from users. Um, but that is, it's one way that governments understand that they can attack Monero. Uh, and then the other way, and this is one that I think is being more used against Bitcoin because it's, it's listed everywhere, is that those, those on and off ramps that include KYC, that know your customer concept, um, are really a danger because they break down the privacy that's provided by a tool, especially a tool like Bitcoin, where it's actually, it's, it actually has fragile pseudonymity more than it has anonymity. Um, so I think that governments are missing the mark, honestly, if they're trying to stop Monero because they're not implementing KYC and they're delisting it from exchanges. Um, but the tools that we're building to work around that are the things like atomic swaps that I mentioned, uh, the things like Surai, which will be, if you, un if you know Thorchain at all, it's, it's a similar concept to that where it can be completely decentralized in nature, but you're able to swap and have high liquidity. Um, but the, the fiat side, getting from dollars, from euros to Monero, is always going to be the tricky one. Um, and I think it's actually somewhat of an, of an advantage for Monero that there aren't many centralized exchanges that list it because people aren't exposed to the pervasive, invasive um, surveillance mechanism of KYC when they're coming into it. Uh, but that will always be the tricky one. That's really where things like URI talking about peer-to-peer -peer economies and uh, ethical vex locks is a term he uses, which is this, this concept of like people have to step up and become that bridge. We can't rely on central, uh, central institutions to be like, yes, this tool helps you fight back against us, but you're welcome to use it. That is not going to last. And if a tool is allowed to persist like that, I think we should be wary that maybe the tool is actually not serving our needs as well as we think. Um, so ultimately, people need to step up. Uh, Monero community has donated tons of money to try and build tools that help to work around this issue. But for the fiat issue specifically, people need to kind of build that in their local communities and enable people to be onboarded and offboarded to and from Monero and Bitcoin. I mean, that's something we need in Bitcoin. People just don't focus on it as much because we have those, those easy centralized exchanges. We have room for one more question. And maybe I would, I would like to comment on that, like one very pragmatic uh, thing which we see, like speaking from the terms of crypto anarchy, which is a tool set, which is pragmatic approach uh, regarding the adoption, what we see is that the dark markets are mostly switching to Monero. Mm -hmm. There is less Bitcoin than it used to be and zero lightning because yep. the receiver's privacy, right? So uh, regarding like the usability and the adoption, like this is for me, that's a signal that the crypto anarchists, the people who actually need it, uh, prefer Monero, right? And um, do we have well, any maybe more questions? Um, I would I would maybe ask uh, your, your opinion on zk tech on achieving privacy using uh, zero knowledge proofs. Whether mm -hmm. there are some technologies that you prefer or yeah, yeah. So first off, to your comment about darknet markets, I, I think that it's something I harp on on Twitter and other platforms, and should have incorporated into this talk. But um, that idea of using darknet markets darknet markets as kind of a litmus test of what technology works when people are in an adversarial environment. Uh, I think is a very important one, and, and like Mario mentioned, darknet markets are not adopting Lightning. Uh, they're actually sl slowly moving away from Bitcoin and to Monero. There are multiple large Monero-only darknet markets. Uh, most darknet markets that aren't Monero-only also list Monero. Um, and so we're seeing this switch in these adversarial environments. So we should think, why are these people who are facing jail time, if the, the tool that they use fails them, why are they switching to Monero? Why are they starting to use it, and why are they valuing it? Um, as for your question on ZK tech, so this, this idea of zero knowledge proofs, which there's a lot of tech that falls under that. Monero actually has zero knowledge proofs as part of the way that it works, but um, the, the tool that sometimes people refer to as like ZK snarks, there's a lot of broader names, but it's this idea that you can build a system that reveals even less information or no information, but is able to still uh, perform complex functions. Um, so if you have a chance, come to the talk that DarkFi is giving. Um, I think Rose is the one presenting there. Uh, and she'll talk about what they're building, which essentially uses this 
this technology, um, but I think there's a ton of value, especially with the the improvements that the Zcash team have come out with, with their latest, the, the protocol called Halo 2 and the actual upgrade to their network called Orchard. Um, I have a lot of other problems with Zcash. There's a reason I stick with Monero right now. But the tech that they've actually built within that is decentralized, is trustless finally, um, and can be used for a lot of very powerful applications like DarkFi, where they're building a decentralized finance tool that is completely private by default, um, which is a, a very necessary thing for, for what we're moving into. And the actual technology is it's brilliant, and it would fix the only really the only weak spot with Monero's transactional privacy is those ring signatures are not perfect. They're, an, they're a great tool, and they're really the ideal for trustlessness right now. Um, but the, the recent the Halo 2 and Orchard improvements to Zcash, that type of protocol, I would definitely expect to see in Monero um, in the next five years or so, because it does have some, some key improvements. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's just a lot of great stuff there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, for your talk. Thank you, folks, for coming. And yeah, please, applause. <laughs>